for those listeners who may not really understand what epigenetics is, the word epi means above and beyond, and genetics the genes. So it's the study of what's even above the genes in terms of how they actually function. And it turns out that the tissue culture medium in which our cells are in contains things like hormones, which are put out from fear. Every emotion has its own hormonal fingerprint, shall we say. Um, the beliefs that we have, all of that affect the chemistry of the blood. And what happens is that the base pairs of the genes don't change. But what does change is little groups called histone groups or methyl groups are added. And the DNA folds differently. And when it folds differently, different genes are exposed uh, and other ones are hidden. And so not only can this completely change the way that your body functions, but it, obviously it affects the mind. Then here's another interesting aspect of, of this. Um, there's a constellation of genes, for example, genes that have to do with how serotonin is metabolized that can be changed epigenetically. And now, you know, there's a whole study of, well, do people with poor impulse control who get angry and murder have problems in these certain genes? And the answer is, yes, it does seem like there's a correlation. And we were talking a little bit about attachment off air. And Ron, you were saying that attachment definitely is very, very important, but it's not the whole picture. And temperament is important. And what controls temperament in part is epigenetics, because here is the big punchline. Remember going to high school, maybe, and studying Lamarckian evolution. It was the kind of thing where you cut off the tail of a mouse. Will the next generation of mice come without tails? And the answer was no, that's ridiculous. But epigenetics does follow Lamarckian uh, <laughs> inheritance. And we know that, that stress and trauma creates epigenetic changes that can last for three to four generations. So now to make this personal, I have always felt, why do I personally have trouble? Not anymore. I've spent a life learning how to be emotionally literate. Um, but for many, many years, I was really a hyperreactor, always on edge. That's why I got interested in this field in part. A relative five years ago sent me a picture of my own family, 13 people, and honest to God, I looked at them and I burst into tears. They looked exactly like me, little kids, all the way up to a great uncle, and they had all perished in Auschwitz. And then I realized, why did my family come here? Well, they came in the late 1800s, all except for this branch of the family, because of pogroms. And they had lived with trauma, and they had lived with fear for generation after generation after generation. And I think what we often miss as clinicians is this. We say, well, this person wasn't in a concentration camp or doesn't have any background of trauma. Why are they behaving like a person who's traumatized? If you look into their family history, probably because they have the same changes that are there because of epigenetics. So we have to be so aware culturally of what the lineage of the person um, predisposed them to. And I think it's a neglected part of practice. And it's all, it's very good for us all to really bear that in mind. <laughs> 